Kirk, another week, another PBT extra. We've got a lot to talk about with Kyrie and LeBron. But first and foremost, how are you doing? How was the weekend? I know you're busy running around trade deadline. Did you get a chance to sleep potentially? Um, not much, frankly. No, between between LeBron and every, uh, yeah, this is the last couple of weeks where I don't really get to do much of anything. Don't do, uh, haven't done anything. Went out to dinner with my wife one night. That was just that was my break. Like so, that's how this week, couple of weeks goes. And hopefully this weekend, things will slow down. I think there's a football game to watch. Like I'll, I'll, uh, I'll no, find there's a halftime show to watch. There's a halftime show. There is a big halftime show to watch. Uh, didn't she get? She'll get snubbed for a Grammy too. Don't worry. Oh man, <laughs> we're not even gonna get. We're not even gonna touch the Grammys. We're not even gonna touch it. You know, there's been uh, so many things happening here in New York. You know, I, um, you know how much I love art. I, I finally found. I found it, Kurt. I told you uh, last week. Yeah. I'm uninspired. I, I found it, Anthony Van Dyke. You know, so I love Peter Paul Rubens. He's kind of my guy. Peter Paul and me. You know, we just like hang out all the time. You know, I go there. You know, just like hang out with his work. One of his students, I never really got behind Tony's work, Anthony Van Dyke, never really got behind Tony's work, but I, I don't know. It just, it all clicked. Last week, I was meandering through the Met and it just clicked. I was standing in front of this one portrait of an Italian, um, uh, I think she was a Marchese, is that I'm saying that right? Uh, and she, and it just hit me all at once. The the references, the Titian, the, the, the way that he depicted lace, I was like, man, this guy slaps. He's, he's, he's an unbelievable artist, so... I feel and, very much inspired right now. And it's impressive when you see, the, I know the Dutch masters and some people did this, when you've got to make your money doing portraitures of rich people, essentially, but find ways to put the artistry in there as opposed to even art. When I toured the Louvre, and uh, I've got great stories from that one. We had this brilliant tour guide uh, with a small group. She's like, look, we've got a lot of stuff. There were a lot of just craftsmen in that era. Hmm. There was a lot of, when you get the Renaissance and the post-Renaissance, there were people who painted for a living, but there weren't a lot of artists. And when you find a true artist who can be brilliant within that somewhat confining structure to a degree, like it's it's impressive. No, absolutely. I, I, I completely agree. You think about like the commerciality. We, we don't want to get too esoteric here, but yeah, how do you become a, a craftsman uh, and, and operating a commercial environment. That's yeah. like, you know, that's all of our conundrums. How do you make something beautiful that sells? And uh, I mean, that's tough. That's very yeah. tough. You know, I, I I also want to say I've been listening to a lot of uh, Duke Ellington and he's uh, a master at that. So, I mean, I, I, there's a great album called Masterpieces by Ellington and I've just been listening to Solitude on repeat. In the last 37 seconds of right. Mood Indigo, Kurt, can we just talk about the last 37 seconds? <laughs> I mean, talk about beautiful. But I, one of the yeah, I think sometimes he gets overshadowed by the people who came after him and, and Duke shouldn't be. Yeah. And, you know, last thing, you know, I've been watching a lot of news recently. I know, you, Kurt, you know, you used to cover news all the time. I mean, my, our, my heart breaks for everything that's happening overseas um, in Turkey and Syria. Thousands dead because of the earthquakes. And it just uh, so our thoughts and prayers from PBT Extra go out to everyone affected over there. I, I, I it's hard to read and hard to follow and hard to grasp the the level of devastation i just it's it's heartbreaking and we have a lot to talk about so let's um let's just dive right in shall we Kirk? so in the basketball world this has been something that has been brewing for not just weeks not just months i mean this has been like becoming into the season kyrie requested trade and we were thinking, can he build up his trade value enough to warrant a trade? And that was a question you and I really had. Here's the details. Here's the actual proof in the pudding. Kyrie Irving traded to the Dallas Mavericks for uh, Spencer Dinwiddie, Dorian Finney-Smith, a 2027 second round pick, and two picks in 2029. A first round pick, unprotected, and a second round pick. So Dallas then gets Kyrie, obviously, and Markeith Morris. What are your thoughts on this trade? Uh, I've got a few, a few of them, a lot of them, really. <laughs> What's the first thought? What's the first thought? We'll start with Dallas, where it's just a sign of their desperation, right? Like, this isn't a trade you make unless you desperately need to put somebody next to Luka Doncic, because not only are you not winning, and you're not really, I mean, he's 23. It's not like, it's not like the LeBron situation where you're like, why are you wasting age 38? How many years left does he have? But you're always on the clock with a superstar, always. And 
this is a this is he Luca's been he's had some off nights. He's had some nights off with injury. Like he, I don't want to say breaking down, but you can see the wear on him from this, and and it's affecting the team. They needed help. This absolutely brings offensive help, and we can talk about on the court, but it comes at a high risk. I don't think you make this move unless you're desperate. But they 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 both are, and <laughs> they didn't give up a, I don't know, James Harden level package, right? Like they gave up a lot, but because, because Kyrie is, let's say nobody wants to give him more than a two year contract after this, because of the, the reliability concerns, um, they didn't have to give up too, too much. So I, I get it from their side, but I mean, Corey, is that a dance you would want to invite yourself to? No. <laughs> so let's start with the positive. Kyrie did something that shocked me, you know, yeah. despite the the turmoil. That's the only word I can think of. Yeah, I mean, the only word, yeah. turmoil that has surrounded him and his tenure in Brooklyn, especially in recent months and, and the past year, the past season, for off-court stuff, not just, you know, on-court, but off-court, yeah. to be able to build up his trade value to warrant this for what is essentially a four-month rental, Kurt, is remarkable. Yeah, I mean, that, I mean, that's, I mean, he's balling out right now. So in that sense, congratulations, Kyrie. You know, that's really impressive. Now let's get into the actual meat of it. You're right. This screams desperate in every sense of the word. And I understand, you know, uh, Luka Doncic just signed a five-year max extension. Like he's in year one of that, right? So I get that. Um, and you tried everything. You tried Chris Depp's Porzingis. You know, you tried to bring in Spencer Dinwiddie. You're like, okay, finally you found someone in Jalen Brunson, but you realize, okay, maybe we can't keep him. Maybe he's not the number two guy. We need a number two. We need a real number two. We'll, we need a real number two. You have him, an all-star level guy, all-NBA level guy in Kyrie Irving, but only for four months, you know, and I, and I think the long-term vision here, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Let's focus on this season. Is it a good move for this season? I think the answer is it could be a brilliant move. You know, like if Kyrie can stay healthy, if, you know, he understands that it's Lucas team, which Jason Kidd was very clear. is like, hey, look, this is not two alphas competing. It's Lucas team. If um, they can, they're only four back, four games back from the number two spot. So, I mean, if they can actually go pretty deep in the playoffs this season and manage the turmoil that Kyrie brings just for four months, I mean, this could be a pretty brilliant move, but I think the cost of this move will be catastrophic for the Dallas Mavericks. They're going to take years to recover from this move. I think all out's going to be like it's going to be cataclysmic, just like we saw in Brooklyn. They they built everything up around Kyrie and, and KD, and it's and it's now it's just taken them four years to get back to to pre KD and Kyrie scorched earth, and then now it's like how long will it take for rejuvenation to come back to Barclays? I have no idea how long it's going to take for for new seedling to to grow up from that scorched earth. I have no idea, Kurt. It's, yeah, I mean, I, Kyrie made his comments about wanting to just focus on the court and, and wanting to be in a place he was celebrated and all this. And I, watching it, and I'm like, I think I even wrote this. I'm like, there are fans in Boston and Cleveland and Brooklyn just like, are like, wait for it, wait for it. It's, it's that sense. But I'm with you on this. Like, they have, it gives them potential this year in a West that's wide open. Where right now, Denver looks like the team to beat, and none of us are. I mean, Denver hasn't done it before. I guess is where it comes to. Like we, we'll get into that some other day. But it feels like they could do it. This should be with the shooting they have on the roster, even after giving these guys up. This should be an elite offense. They yeah. should be able to put with Christian Wood and Kleber and and Hardaway and everybody else they've got. Points are going to come. They are going to outscore a lot of teams. But you get to the playoffs, they had the 23rd or 24th ranked defense in the league, depending on which metrics you tend to use. But bottom 10 defense, and they just traded away Torian Finney-Smith, their best perimeter defender by a mile. They're not going to get a lot of stops. And so outside of making some money betting the over, like I don't know what you – like I don't know that this is a team that's got a long playoff run in them. I don't think – if you're going to win a – like make the finals – if you're, or even maybe get to the conference finals and you're going to win three series, two series, even you've got to do it in a little bit different ways. Like you've got to be able to adjust and adapt and all right, we didn't do this. The best teams have scheme versatility where they can, Boston can beat you. Want to, want to go big, pound it inside. Want to go like, we can beat you all these different ways. 
They can't. Dallas can't. They got one system and they're just going to, it's going to be this. So I don't, I'm not sold that it's, I think they've got a chance this year. And then I'm with you on the long term. I'm just, you, it, yeah, starts, think, it even starts this summer, Corey. You're going to have to sign him. It starts right. like immediately. Like immediately, the question is, you know, Kyrie Irving's going to be there saying, okay, what about this long term extension? Yeah. You know, and like, that's what he wanted. That was the big thing he wanted from Brooklyn. No one was willing to commit because they were saying, we don't want a part time player. Like, and it's a, it's a fascinating concept that, you know, the Brooklyn Nets, who, once again, built yep. something beautiful that attracted Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving. So that that is where I was thinking, wow, Brooklyn is doing something phenomenal. They're one of the best front offices in, in the league. They brought in um, people to build a whole team around. It turns out that that was a very, 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 very unstable foundation to think that three, uh, I mean, two, all three of their superstars, all NBA, future Hall of Famers, right? They all requested trades, two were granted, and then they brought another disgruntled superstar in. So to me, that is just chaos leading to greater chaos, all because they built on a foundation that was Kevin Durant and, and Kyrie Irving. Now, the thing about Dallas is so interesting is that, that they were attracted to that chaos, thinking that they could manage that chaos, like I said, with, with Kyrie. The question is, for how long? Is Luka's you know, grip on that team, and is that Dallas Mavericks culture strong enough yeah. to weather four months plus of Kyrie Irving? I don't think so, you know, and that's kind of, so that is my first concern. And then, yeah, the extension conversation is going to happen immediately. And then going in, even if they do make the playoffs and go deep, like yeah. really deep, it's going to be the, it's going to be the conversation the entire time. Okay. Well, great. Like you guys are playing well. Like when's the extension coming? Yeah. When's the yeah. extension coming? Is there yeah. always more questions with Kyrie? Yeah. And it's, it, to be clear, it's, it'll be a new contract. He, he, he technically can sign an extension with them, but he won't do it. It's 78 million over two years, which is the max they can give him as an extension, which is a lot of money, but frankly, a low market for him. The yeah. question isn't money with him. It's years. Everybody, nobody, nobody, nobody's blinking at him being a max player because 27 points a game. Yeah, he's a, he's a, yeah super talented. Yeah. But years, how long do you want to be in the Kyrie business? And that's, that's going to be the interesting part of it this summer. And what did you think of it from Brooklyn's perspective? I thought Brooklyn did a great job of cutting bait. This is one of the things that I think is really fascinating. So pride is a, is a terrible thing, Kurt. Yes. And one of the things that I think is very difficult for people in leadership positions because they don't want to look stupid you know, or foolish is saying we were wrong. Let's reverse course. As I mentioned, Brooklyn was doing brilliant. They were one of the best front offices pre-2019 they were one of the best front offices in the nba they were like acquiring draft picks they were creating like building and developing talent which is something that you rarely see in the nba they looked as if they had like a clear like alignment on all levels. i mean it was like wonderful i was like wow this is like a renaissance is happening in brooklyn so the fact that they needed to spend these four years of so much drama getting back to pre kevin you know basically pre-2019 pre-kd pre-kyrie I think uh, they're finally realizing let's let's just cut bait, reverse course, and and do this a different way. And that takes a, a lot of a lot of humility and a lot of courage to do that in such a big market. So I, I think this was a great first step. And then I, at first, really, Kurt, I thought, well, there's no way they're gonna there there's no way they're gonna let Kyrie walk. First of all, there's no team that would be willing to do this. That you know that that and, and that is wise, I should say. But then I found out that there's always someone willing to, to roll the dice, right? There's always someone willing to make a risky decision, which is, you know, human nature, I guess. Uh, yeah. But they, right when it seemed like it was like not even going to happen in my mind. And then two days later, immediately like done. So yeah. I, I think that Brooklyn's made a very good decision of just like, let's just move on. We made, we learned our mistake last year. Let's just move on and, and just pivot as an organization. A lot of courage. No, it's, it's interesting. They also in the short term with, and this is the reason they took, Finney Smith and Dinwiddie over, you know, something like the Lakers package with picks way out. They want to try to keep Kevin Durant, who they've still remember just signed an extension. They've got it's, to it's not going to happen. <laughs> well, I know, that's the thing. They, short term, they're going to try to win this year. This summer, Corey, you and I are going to be doing this talking about where Kevin Durant's going to land. I just I see whether it's Miami or whatever happens. I just can't imagine that this is going to end well. That he's they're not going to trade him before the deadline. That is too big a deal, too many moving parts. And those are the kind of trades, the super big trades like that. It's just easy over the, easier over the summer under the new cap limits. You can 
you can have 20 players on the roster rather than 15. So you can take a four for one trade and make it, you know, all that kind of stuff. It's just easier to do summer trades. And that's when you put together a massive Durant deal. But I, I'm with you. I, I, I mean, I just personally can't imagine he's going to be a Brooklyn net next year. Yeah. I mean, once again, this, this guy requested a trade. Yeah. And then uh, it took like the owner flying out, <laughs> like meet with this guy, you know, like, like this is not a tenable situation. It will not last. I do think we, as far as like the rest of the season, I think you can basically write it off. You know, the nets are going to continue yeah. to slip, you know, and, and that that's unfortunate for them. Um, I think with Dallas though, if I just want to bring this, because I think this is a really interesting conversation with, with Dallas. When you talk about Luca and where that team's going, um, the, the the common and you know you and I talk about this all the time like the common thought process in today's NBA you need like an MVP kind of caliber player and then like an All Star or an All NBA you know number two guy and then like a really good number three you know kind of like a glue guy in order to 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 make it and you obviously need a great defensive team right and and they know they have an MVP candidate in Luca they find the guy that number two they think and moving forward though. I, do you what is the window as far as like when do they need to figure it out before Luca requests a trade? You know, if, if that ever should happen, like what is that timeline? Like how much time do they have to work with? I, it's a good question. I think because he's young and happy and making money that they've got. I mean, again, he's in the first year of this. I have a five year deal, but technically four because the last year is a player option. That I mean, I don't know where the cap's going to be, but I'd be shocked if he ends up, you know, just the way the NBA is going, I'd be surprised if he picks that option up. I think they've got this summer all the way into next summer to figure out what this is ultimately going to look like up the summer of 2024. But if they start that 24, 25 season without a contender, Hmm. I I think the leverage shifts then suddenly you're on the back end of that contract and it's Luca's not happy. You have to think about, so suddenly the, well, if we, if we're going to lose him, do we have to trade him? Do we want to do it early a la Anthony Davis so we get a return? Like that conversation doesn't happen for a couple of years, but it looms. And Luca's the level of player where other front offices, they sketch that out one night. They, they have their brainstorming sessions there. If Luca comes available, what, you know, like you start working through that a little bit. Where do we want to be? I mean, they did it. Giannis ended up resigning, you know, Antetokounmpo resigned in in Milwaukee. Every team had a plan. <laughs> Every team had a plan just in case he decided he did want to move on. So I think it's going to be the same kind of thing with with Luca, and and we'll see, you know, we'll see where they're at in a couple of years. They, they've got time, but again, like I said, when you have a superstar, you're on the clock. And by the way, one of the smart things Brooklyn did in this trade, every one of those draft picks is after Luca's contract ends. Mm. he very well might stay he very well would re-up and spend his whole career i hope honestly i like it when a player spends his whole career in one team i would love for him to retire a maverick smart move to play that out just in case just, just in case. yeah so yeah I, got, I gotta say with with um first and foremost it's my personal belief that it, it doesn't really matter who comes out the west i think boston's gonna win it all yeah. i think you know i think it's gonna be from the east i personally that's my my take um so i i think you know this season like i said a desperate move for no avail, in my personal opinion, um, just more drama. But it, but it is really fascinating to me because ultimately you have to ask, what is your goal? And we talk about this a lot too in our podcast. Yeah. Is your goal to make money, to be like you know a business, like a, actually like have a profit, or is your is your goal you know to like win a championship? Um, and it seems as though I know Dallas obviously wants to win a championship. They're trying to figure it out with Luca. It's very clear. But it also doesn't hurt. It also doesn't hurt to have you know everyone talking about Dallas now, you know, not only because of Luca, but also because of the theater that follows Kyrie, you end up having, you know, almost like a, like a, like a Broadway show or like a Las Vegas residency. You, you have that kind of attention on you where you're getting national TV games more often too. Everyone wants to see how this will work out um, for the last four you know, months of the season, maybe go further in the playoffs, get some more ticket revenue. Like this isn't a bad thing uh, as far as like a business standpoint of like, this is entertainment. And having Kyrie and Luca together is that's a pretty good ticket. You know, that's how we can decorate your apartment, Corey. We're just going to get you one jer- Kyrie jersey from every stop during his career, and we'll just line them up on the wall. 
<laughs> what about all my Spurs jerseys, man? Like, I, <laughs> I, I gotta have space for my Tim Duncan jersey. But yeah, so let, let's let's talk about um, let's talk about Kyrie. So in my in my jukebox, yeah, of course, I, this I, whole thing about LeBron and Kyrie. Um, so I picked a song by Bjork. Um, it's called Human Behavior, and I'm just gonna read some of these lyrics because I feel like that would be the best. And I'm just gonna. So here it is. These are the lyrics to Human Behavior. If you ever get close to a human and human behavior, be ready, be ready to get confused. And me and my hereafter, there's definitely, definitely, definitely no logic to human behavior, but yet so, yet so irresistible. And me and my fear can, and there's no map. I mean, that that to me sums up Kyrie's career, but also this current moment. Like, I have no idea. I'm very confused all the time. There doesn't seem to be any logic. But he's so just irresistible. Like he, his gifts are just beyond. They're they're otherworldly. They are. By the way, the, the Bjork, the biggest rock star ever out of Iceland, I believe. Yes. <laughs> I, I say and an avant-garde superstar, by the way. Yeah, I mean, she's on like everyone's favorite. Like your favorite avant-garde artist, like mood board has Bjork on it. Yeah, and I, I think inspired one one of those artists who inspires a lot of other artists. Um, really kind of works well in in those circles yeah that's actually a great a great selection and the eclecticness of bjork kind of fits with Kyrie too yes very eclectic uh so we can we already talked enough about Kyrie. let's talk about lebron because this is this is like a crazy moment you know where we we get to see um i know there are a lot of records and i love to hear your thoughts about you know what record matters and like what role does that have in legacy truly? Um, but he did it. Like he passed Kareem. And this is a in my personal opinion, a record that is perfectly, you know, epitomizes what LeBron James is all about, which is longevity, like sustained excellence, planning. Yeah. Like this is a, this is one of those records you gotta kind of plan. Like you have to like just like Kareem was doing yoga, like LeBron has like as an 18 year old has to think, okay, I'm going after, you know, 20 years in the league. How do I do it? This is one of those kind of records. Um but I think I had to I had to bring in folk superstar and one of the best American writers ever, uh, Bob Dylan, into the conversation. Um, and it's one of the greatest songs by him, in my personal opinion, called "Got to Serve Somebody," because it doesn't matter how many records you have or how many Hall of Fame, you know, yeah. like if you're a first ballot or how many championships. At the end of the day, you're, you're going to have to serve somebody. And it's a really interesting question of like, okay, well. Who is LeBron serving? You know the team, like his career, like you know. I know, I know the Lakers lost that game, but even when you become the greatest of all time or in the conversation for be the greatest of all time, like you still have an employer, which is like a hard concept. And there's going to come a time when like you have to figure out, okay, well, what's what do we do as an organization? You know, late in the career, we saw that you know so many times over and over again. Like even with Tom, um, with Joe Montana, it happened with Steve Young. Like you know, he's he, at the time he was the greatest of all time. And then he got injured late in his career. Steve Young comes in in the championship game and wins. And then Joe Montana never starts again. And like, so how do you deal with that like concept that you're the greatest or one of the greatest, but you're still an employee? That's actually a really interesting, yeah, a thought with with him because I think when you said serve too, I first thing I popped up in my mind was the way LeBron has led off the court, not. He's inspired a lot of players with how he's gotten his brand and his business and his his entertainment business moving while and using the power of his brand to kind of jumpstart this. But he did. He built a school in Akron, right? Like he is very active on in political issues and social issues and pick, he picks his spots a little bit. He, he's active with his voice in this in a way that that. Certainly Michael wasn't and other generations weren't uh, different people, different times. But uh, I think he has served. And then on the court, it's a really interesting thing Darvin Ham said last night, and I slid it into one of the stories I had from the game. They were asked about, you know, look, he's kind of a playmaker, right? LeBron's serving his teammates when he's out there more than, than attacking and scoring first, right? And Ham's reaction is was, when you empower everyone else and make them a threat, your lane to scoring becomes cleaner and easier because I can't ignore this guy and this guy and this guy because when LeBron's out there, 
they're still a threat. When Russell Westbrook has the ball, I mean, I guess he does dish a lot, but name your name the there's plenty of uh me first, me second, me third scorers out there who Michael, it took a while to learn how to empower his teammates. Kobe, it took a while. Uh, and and some brow beating from the veterans on those Lakers to learn how to empower his teammates. That but you can't win unless you get there. LeBron kind of came in with that attitude, didn't he? Yeah, I mean that, that's I think is um, yeah indicative. He, he he's a pass first guy. Yeah. And but so it, it is an interesting um, conversation when you think well when you when you are the focus you know of course like this is just like basketball one on one you know when when there are two guys on you. When you collapse the, the defense, yeah. there's one open guy. This is an allocation of resources problem, you know, yeah. and anyone who's interested in logistics or like, <laughs> you know, like they, they'd be able to say, okay, well, we have to, what do we do? We don't have enough resources. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it makes, that's a really interesting read on the song too. Um, yeah, but I, I just think about this question of like legacy, because the biggest question around LeBron James, you know, is where will he fall, you know, in the greatest of all time conversation? And I know it's for me that is not a worthwhile conversation just because the greatest of all time, Kurt, you know, it's like, well, what does that even mean? Like, are you the greatest champion of all time? Like Bill Russell, you know, are you like, you know, like, are you talking about greatest, you know, dominant of all time? Like, you know, Will Chamberlain, like how many records does he own? You know, like there's no one who'd even, like, he was clearly the most dominant player of all time. Are you talking about like, you know, like the prodigy of basketball? That was Kareem. Kareem was a prodigy in high school and college. And so it's like, so like there's so many different ways you could define that question. So that's why I mean it's not like a worthwhile conversation, in my personal opinion. But when you when you're obsessed with this concept of legacy, you, I don't th- I don't think people realize that even legends have to serve somebody. Yeah. And at the end of the day, like you're a slave to the game and the history of the game. And LeBron's very clear that you know he's he's a basketball historian. So I, I that's kind of the angle I want to take with this is like you know you're chasing something, but you know you end up being like a slave to to the game that you're chasing. It's Kind of esoteric, very philosophical, but so is Bob Dylan, you know, sometimes. Yeah, that's true. And and I think, wouldn't you say more than others, and maybe more than, I, I, I don't know that as much about Tom Brady or didn't cover him the same way, but LeBron appreciates his place in history because of that studying of the past. I don't know, in a way, I'm not sure every superstar does. Yeah, I mean, he, he's, yeah, I, I think that's a very uh, astute observation, Kurt. You know, I, I think when, when you have an understanding of history, you can understand, you know, how you build on it and how you diverged, yeah. you know? Um, and I think he understands that like, okay, well, Magic Johnson came before LeBron. So six, eight point guard is normal, you know, like, like how can we, how can we build on that idea? Um, so like, like understanding Elgin Baylor is like so crucial to understanding Kobe and Michael Jordan and LeBron, you know, like, so like there, there are so many um, things I think that, and I think the great thing about history is in LeBron surpassing Kareem, there were all these specials on Kareem and his yeah. career that then lift. So it's almost like um, it's a second life for everyone who came before. Like you look at that scoring leader list, Bob Pettit was on that list. You know, uh, there was uh, George Mikan on that list. So it's almost like you breathe new life into all the people who used to hold that record too. And I think LeBron James understands that when he wins, the game of basketball wins, you know, because all the legends are, are once again remembered and live forever brief a moment. By the way, you know who was in the building last night besides Denzel and Bad Bunny and and all these other celebrities? Bob McAdoo was mm-hmm. courtside for the game along with Kareem, but uh, Bob McAdoo was there, and I'm like, you know, sometimes I don't think enough about like that's a, I mean, two time champion scoring. I think he won an MVP. I think he won a couple of scoring titles. Bob McAdoo could flat out play, and you just hadn't thought about him in a while, so it was fun to fun to see him out there and, and think about that. Yeah, why don't we dive into that? What was it like to be there for history? I heard that they credentialed over 200 media members. Yeah, yeah it, it felt like an NBA Finals game, both in terms of the crush of media, um, <laughs> but also, yeah, I, I guess mentally, like, I'm, I'm prepared for it for the Finals, and it's harder on a random Tuesday night in February to have that mindset for me, but also... In terms of the energy in the building and around the building, there were, I mean, there's out in the Statue Plaza that probably has a name other than Statue Plaza, out in front of, of Crypto.com Arena where there's all these Lakers and Kings and and a, an Oscar de la Hoya statue. 
there's always people out taking pictures before Laker games and, and doing stuff. But the number of people and the energy in the area was way higher. And you get in the building and it really did feel like a finals game. And it also felt like Laker fans were slow to embrace LeBron as one of their own. They didn't do it instantly because I think there were a lot of factors. He came on the heels of Kobe Bryant, which was big shoes to follow. Um, they didn't make the playoffs the first year LeBron was here. And even though that wasn't necessarily his fault, um, when they finally, you know, the next year they win the title, but everybody gets to watch it kind of alone at home on their TVs. They can't, there's no community in Long Beach, right? I mean, Long Beach and well in Long Beach, but in Los Angeles, people, not only aren't there people watching this at Staples because it's happening in a bubble and there's, there's nobody in the bars. There's nobody in the restaurants, right? Like it's, it's all kind of during that still isolated COVID phase. So it just was slow. And I think this was the first, well, maybe the first, maybe the most recognizable moment where LeBron was embraced by Lakers fans, the energy in that building to, to, to kind of put himself back in that pantheon, even though he'd won a title and done all this other stuff. This was the moment they were embraced. It was a crazy energy in the building. And it's, and it was, it was, it made him emotional. You could see him kind of raise his arms when he hits the shot and, and soak in the moment for a minute. And he kind of doubles over and he's wiping away tears. He was, it was, it was powerful for him. Yeah. For, for a basketball historian to etch his name there. And yeah. he, I mean, like, this is one of those crazy moments that, you know, that you, you can only dream of, especially when you set out. Like, you know, like we, we talk about this all the time. He knew he wanted to be great. So he made a decision early on. He had the ability and the skill and then devoted his life to the game and for the game, you know, to recognize him and his greatness. And, and, and as a basketball historian, you know, all of us know that the Lakers, I mean, yeah, Lakers, yeah. Celtics, I mean, what, what do those franchise, franchises mean to the NBA? Like the NBA wouldn't be what it is without the epic Lakers rivalries Lakers Celtics rivalries in the '60s with Bill Russell, Jerry West, Will Chamberlain, you know all that, all those teams, and then of course with Magic, Kareem, and like Larry Bird in the '80s. Like those are the team, those are the rivalries that made the NBA what it is today. So to to basically, and this is what I think is so interesting about LeBron, is that it almost seems premeditated. Yeah. Um, the way that he has kind of went on this scavenger hunt of greatness. And like, it's almost like he has like a manual of like basketball history and he's going around and saying, okay, well, look, like one of the things that makes, you know, um, like what makes a hero go back to your hometown, number one overall draft pick, rookie of the year, MVP, all this stuff, go back to your hometown, win a title, you know, like do the whole super team with Miami, do the whole free agency uh, business, but go to Miami, you're going to get your jersey retired there. So now you get your jersey retired at home in Miami. You get your jersey retired under two different numbers. You know, only greats have done that. Yeah. You have, and then get your jersey retired in the Lakers arena, yeah. you know, like, and then enter yourself into the Pantheon at the end of your career as you fade off into the sunset. I um, mean, that, that is like, he's collecting everything you can in order to basically, you know, etch himself as undeniably the greatest of all time, which is an interesting question. Yeah. And, and, the scoring title alone, he, you know, Kareem held it for 38 years. I, probably will be about that long. I mean, right now, Corey, there's no active player within 10,000 points of him. And the second guy, the guy closest to him is Kevin Durant, who's yeah. not going to be playing for another 15 or 20 years. Um, I don't, you know, I don't know who catches him. I don't know who's going to play that long at that level and, and do it. It feels like it's going to be, a long time. And by the way, I know producer Dan had a ton of stats to, to throw out. You know what my favorite might be out of all this? LeBron James played, obviously, for the Miami Heat. Won two championships, was there four years, I think. Mm-hmm. Four years. He is also the leading scorer all time against the Miami Heat. <laughs> I know you're in the game long enough. It's crazy things will happen. <laughs> No, I, I think you're right. Like, like I said, I, I think it's really interesting. I just, you know, I had this kind of thought today. I was like, hmm, he's, yeah, like for a guy, like I said, who loves basketball history, understanding his place in the game, he's so acutely aware of it. And he knows he has a, the runway. One of the things that most people don't have the luxury of is time. But yeah. LeBron has taken care of his body. So he does have the luxury of time. Like he wants to play till he's been vocal about that, about 44, 45. He wants to keep playing. And, he, and he's playing at a super high level in his late 30s. 
So you think, okay, well, he can continue to play at a high level. When's the next basketball player who can play at a high level like that, averaging 30 points a game in his early 40s? You know, like that's a 25 plus year career at that level. I mean, you're going to, like I said, I think on paper, it's going to be very difficult, especially how well LeBron knows the game of basketball and all the all the records he's collecting and all the things he's trying to do. Um, it's going to be very difficult to debunk that that argument. It's like, well, is he the greatest of all time? Like just by virtue of playing the game that long and doing the scavenger hunt, it's going to be very hard. But like, you know, how can you? not say Michael Jordan, you know, like, how can you not say, it's like, so like, that's what I mean, like, then it gets into subjectivity, but as far as like factual data at the end of the day is going to be concerned, it's going to be very difficult, I think, in five or seven years to say he's not the greatest of all time. I'm with you. I think we can argue about impact and career and all that, but in terms of a well-rounded player, and by the way, you mentioned the other thing, that the conditioning, the fitness, there's a big story up at NBC Sports about this that I wrote for where LeBron talks about, you know, icing himself in high school and as a rookie and, and stretching and, and other Greg Popovich, all these other people talking about this with him and, and the investment he's made in his body, but beyond, and we talked about it last week, but what I was really doing the research, it's crazy. 20 years, he hasn't missed a game due to a surgery. He he's the, sur- the two surgeries he's had during his playing career were Lasix and, wow. <laughs> and, and an oral surgery he had off season on a, a a gland issue, you know, something in his mouth. It's kind of both impressive. Like it, it, the old Branch Ricky baseball line, luck is the residue of design. Like he's put in the work, but you also, you do get a little bit lucky, right? Like nobody randomly fell into his knee at an awkward angle. And, you know, like, like, like the reason to rants out right now, like you, you also just have to get a little lucky. And, and LeBron's had that too. I know. That's what I mean is like, it almost seems premeditated and it's kind of scary. And I think, you know, once again, don't really like the goat conversation, but when you think about legacy, you would have to argue, you know, like the nineties people only won because Michael Jordan retired or like the team broke up. Like it was like, so Michael Jordan dependent. And then same thing with the sixties and with Bill Russell, like you only won because like, like is he going to go coach now? <laughs> like, you know, like, like, it's just kind of like, it's almost like who's going to come in second place in those two decades. And that's like the only time it's ever happened in basketball, right? Like, so like how, but, but then when you think about once again, on paper, LeBron is just by virtue of playing that long at that level um, and not getting injured, just being available. Availability is his superpower and it might make him the greatest of all time just by virtue of, well, he's the last one standing. And that's a really, that's a really interesting conversation that you, you know, that I'm sure a lot of bar flies are going to have for decades and decades to come. It's just, you know, and it's between, a very interesting one. I will add this. LeBron, between the two stints in Cleveland with Miami in the middle, went to, I believe, 10 straight NBA finals. Might be nine. That was nine or 10 straight NBA finals, which is in this like Jerry era. West. Yeah. That's it, like Jerry West. It, it, it's, it's in this era. That's it's unprecedented. So let's talk about the CBA. Um, now, now we'll drag it down. All right. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's, it's, it's a. Yeah, it, you know, let, let's talk about it. Well, uh, what, what's going on here? Uh, the NBA is in the midst of CBA negotiations, the collective bargaining agreement, which really quick definition. I, and this is one of those things, and I think producer Dan hit the nail on the head. Everybody talks about it because you know it comes up with the word lockout pretty much half the time, right? Like, wait, they're talking about this. The CBA is ultimately a contract between the league, the players, the owners, and the players union that governs literally everything, player salaries, what a max is, what a rookie salary is, what the rules of salaries are, the luxury tax, um, the basics of a contract, how teams travel, like it covers everything, all of free agency, it covers trades. It is a comprehensive, massive document um, that is, employed a lot of lawyers and specialists. <laughs> Every team has guys who just deal with this. Um, they're negotiating a new one with the NBA and players um, union right now. They have now, as of this week, twice pushed back out the opt-out date, which means either side could opt out and just say, hey, this summer, if we don't have a deal done by June 30th, July 1st, there's a lockout. Basically, there would be a lockout. Neither side wants that. 
both sides are making a lot of money. So they are in the midst of negotiations, Corey. And what I will say six months ago, I was told would be, oh, no, nobody wants to nobody wants to kill a golden goose. Everybody's making money. We're finally back from the pandemic. It's rolling. Things change. And it wasn't the players. It was infighting among the owners. Um, the money that the Warriors with their new building with Joe Lacob, but also like the money generated by Chase Center with Steve Ballmer and Joe Sy, who are in <laughs> like these, they're all obscenely rich because they're billionaires, but like obscenely but rich really like, at a very, yeah, at a very high clip. And where the luxury tax and the structures put in place to rein in spending of owners. So somebody just doesn't go nuts and spend outspend everybody and turn this into the premier league. Um, Which is in trouble, by the way. Yeah, I'm like, so they said that I'm like, maybe with, I should ask some man city people if that's really fair. Um, But that kind of, you know, spending, they, it doesn't apply to them. They, you know, Steve Ballmer genuinely does not care about your luxury tax. It's, it's the money he finds in his couch. Right. So the cushions of his couch. So, how do they do this? The owners came up with what they, a few of them turned an upper spending limit, which is a hard cap by any other name. And the players union was adamant. No, it's, it's what has slowed the talks down, but uh, the owners are backing off that they have till mo- the new deadline is March 31st. And there is guarded optimism. We'll go with uh, mm-hmm. at least some hope that, um, the sides can reach a deal by then. There's going to be a lot of tweet. There's not going to, it's not going to be a CBA with a massive overhaul. It's not going to be, you know, this happens in every sport every once in a while where it just, Hey, we're not, we need to really restructure the whole thing. Right. Like it's not that it's more tweaks, but what the luxury tax will look like, what the extensions will look like uh, when you can extend a player, there's be some stuff like that. Uh, Do a, is the NBA going to go back to, kill one and done for example all that stuff's covered in the cba it's all on the table right now it's all being negotiated uh the mo- shockingly tory though really it's in every sport isn't it about the money at the end of the day well i was wondering like what are, what are the implications of the upper spending limit like from a, like just let me just think it like work it out for us you know if you're going to think through it the pros and cons the 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 pros for the owners is that if Look, you're a Spurs fan. The whole family can't spend like Ballmer, right? It's just if you're in, if, if you're running a business in a, in, even in a, a, a decent, if you're Milwaukee, you're in a nice market. Miami, you're in a good market with a wealthy owner. You can't spend like those guys if they're willing to just blow it up and ignore. Hey, tax, fine, I'll pay the tax, whatever. And so I think that for the owners, some of them saw this upper spending limit, this hard cap as a a way to rein those owners in, to stop what they saw as, as excessive spending and kind of almost a loophole in the cap. But it's it plays into a bigger thing that we have talked about, which is the influx. And because this is a profitable venture now, you've got government entities from... Gulf states, you know, buying Premier League teams, buying um, Paris, Golfing. yeah, yes, PSG, Paris, like they, they golf tours, right? Like so, and they can the new rules in the NBA, they can invest up to twenty percent of a team can be from from one of these, I think, sovereign state funds or whatever I believe they're called. Um, that's a lot of money, and I think that 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 shift is worrisome. For some of the owners, not all, but enough of them that this got at, this got on the table. But the players were going to have none of it. <laughs> the play, the NBA. It's confusing to me though, because it's confusing to me. Because on one hand, you know, I understand you want to be able to protect the players' interests, but on the other hand, it seems like the way that the players they move so freely and they want to team up together, um, knowing that like if you're going to have Steph Curry you know, Kevin Durant, Clay Thompson, like you're going to go over the, you're going to go over the, the, yeah. the, like the cap, right? So you're going to be playing luxury tax anyways to assemble these super teams that players want to go to Philadelphia or they want to go to Brooklyn. So it seems as though, you know, they're exacerbating the problem in that sense 
you know, like which, which is forcing teams to spin because they're like, look, you know, you guys are all asking for max deals and like, how are we going to pay four superstars? Yeah, exactly. I mean, Golden State's about to run into this. It's, it's, it's a conversation for another day, Corey, but the music's going to stop there with how much they can spend starting next year. Um, and Draymond Green may be the guy without a chair. Like it's it. There's going to have to be. The, the, the bill has come due. That that said, I think the bigger concern for the players was just precedent. It's it is a bad precedent for them to allow any kind of hard cap because then that the next time through the owners will want that cap. Yeah, you know, again. Right, right. You know they they. They'll, they'll tighten that bent. So I, I think that for them, it's a precedent and the owners have ultimately backed off a, enough, but there will be changes. And, 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 and I don't, I'm not tied in enough with, I, I don't run with billionaires. Um, uh, I don't know what those changes will be, but I have heard that there will be significant tweaks to the luxury tax system to make it tougher on not, not to just go a lot of teams, especially if they're going to win or willing to go over the, I'll, we'll pay the tax if we're going to win is like owner 101, but there's going over the cap. And then there's this, this season, the luxury tax bill for the Clippers will be more than all, but I think six teams spend total on player salaries. Yeah. Like the, the, when, when you're doing that, it's, it's not a balanced field and they're going to try to solve that problem. Yeah, the, the illusion of uh, a competitive landscape goes out the window, and that yeah. then is not good for the entire league. You know, it's also interesting, too, in a lock in, let's say it does, you know, let's think it through that um, thought experiment. If it does go to a lockout, which team stands to benefit in a shortened season? You know, like who can take advantage of that of that and, and win it, yeah. similar yeah. to like the bubble? I think it's an interesting conversation to have, uh, much to much to think about and look forward to eagerly. But let's, let's go ahead and wrap up, shall we? We've had a uh, uh, we've talked about a lot, covered a lot of ground. Legacy is probably one of the most important things we talked about today. So why don't we transition to the Grammys? A lot of things have happened. Um, I know that you love music. If you had an album up, you know, for the Grammys or you were a, a musical artist, what genre would you want to, to, to play in or be a part of? Well, obviously, I'd want to be Harry Styles because I won. <laughs> no, I didn't say be a person. Be, so I want to be a pop. Be a pop no, 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 no. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm just trying to get under your skin, Corey, because I know, <laughs> how, you know how that. Um, honestly, I would go way off the board, and I believe they have won Grammys. I would actually have to have researched that more than I did. But if you could, like, music is joy to me. Like, mm -hmm. it is a release. It is fun. It is something so, like, I mean, you, I, we've discussed, I, you'd be tempted to think I would go to a punk band from my youth and want to be in that kind of environment. But honestly, the music that's bringing me joy now is Preservation Hall Jazz Band. Like, I <laughs> think it would be so much fun to be a horn player in the Preservation Hall Jazz Band in New Orleans playing classic New Orleans jazz and touring the country promoting that That style of music that helped change America in a lot of ways. And then we can go down that road another time. But like, I think being in the, like that band is just, they're just fun. They're just, I've seen them in new Orleans. I've actually seen them open for trombone shorty out in LA. Like they're just, I watch that and I listen to them all the time. I'm like, you know, that's just fun. So like, that would be it. I want to be in the preservation hall jazz band. What about, which is a really offbeat choice. What about you, Corey? Yeah, I think I would go similar. I would go very similar in the sense that, you know, jazz is just black folk music. I, I would go um, folk music. You know, I would like to be a folk musician. Uh, I think folk is like all music, you know, like really great music, I think is it's, you know, some sort of folk music. So that's what I would choose. I don't know what type of folk music, because I mean, I said that like, there's so many different types. Um, maybe I could create my own folk music, like a new, a new folk. But yeah, I would do folk, certainly. It's appropriate for a guy who brought Bob Dylan into the conversation this week. <laughs> and with that, let's wrap it up. So it's, it's been a pleasure. If you want to learn more about what's going on and, and be abreast of all the trade deadline, don't you have a ticker, uh, like a tracker or something? Yeah. If, if you want to know what's going on, um, and this is coming up, you, this podcast will be out. There won't be a ton of time left. But if you want to know everything going on, we've got a tracker you can find at NBCSports.com with all the latest rumors, 
a little bit of analysis on all the trades. If you want to find out what's going on, log in there. You can find it all in one place. Go check it out ASAP. See you next week, Kurt. Take care, Corey.